This is lucky. Look how lucky I am, huh? So I'm here with, um, let's see, guest of honor and uh, award winner for best writer last night at the Harvey. Thank you, Christy. It is Christy. <laughs> we will be getting a shot money. <laughs> that settles it. Um, next to him is the loveliest woman in comics and the most talented, Louise Simonson. Aww. And the guy at the end, he, he still owes me a speech. Just some random guy that they pulled him off the street. <laughs> he was out there with the sign, shop will, will, will panel will. for food. <laughs> the one and only amazing Walter Simonson. Power couple right there. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk, I'm going to try not to talk too much, but this is going to be a little thing about how graphic narratives reflect the story of our culture and vice versa. So I like to think of comic books as cultural mirrors because they're, very, they're put out very quickly. Um, so graphic narratives have been around for thousands of years. Um, you weren't around quite then. No. Uh, but from Walt was. I was. I was. Not, I was that was me. And I was, I was around almost as long as he's been. So. <laughs> That's right. Not quite. <laughs> so they've been around for thousands of years, from Trajan's Column in 113 AD Rome, the work of William Hogarth in the 1700s. Um, Hogarth created sequential images to tell a story. And then you have um, the Yellow Kid appearing in the 1800s. A lot of people think of this as the first real comic book. Um, and, but the comics that we know kind of showed up, come on, there you go. Now, now we're, we're, I went too fast. It was that clicking thing. The first comics that we, we kind of recognize as comics were in the early 30s. Bunnies on Prey, they were printed in the size format comics are known for, but they're simply reprints of comics strips. And this started the golden age of comics. So, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a quick 75 year tour of comics and how these graphic narratives can reflect our own culture, using them as primary documents. Creators can't really hide from their surroundings. They give insight into how the world is represented in different ways. So we're gonna look at different decades, keeping in mind there's a lot of crossover to see what was occurring during those times, and then we'll see how comics reflect culture in its narratives. But before that, let's talk to this amazing panel about how you, you really can't hide from your surroundings and how current events and things creep up in your stories. So do you have any examples of that? Oh gosh, um, one of the Superman stories that we did, uh, it's really seriously current events, we had uh, um, Bill Clinton and Hillary <laughs> talk about the death of Superman, so I guess, yeah, I guess that's kind of current events. I mean, all, there, there were a lot of 
a, a, a lot of stuff that happens in present, call, pres, our present times are reflected in the comics. You know, the, the wars, um, a lot of, lot of stuff. Also, this is a not quite current, but in one of the Superman books that Weezy and John Magana did, it was a three-issue story about the Holocaust. Oh yes, we did. And that. Superman's relationship to the Holocaust, in a sense, and which was uh, really inspired, obviously, by real-life events, and trying to mix that in with a story that would actually have some relevance and some meaning about those characters. And it's right, it was quite good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the trick is to rather than literally take stuff directly from the headlines, sort of let that stuff filter in and sort of put your your sort of adventure comics spin on it or your or your do something to sort of if you're working in a superhero mold, obviously give it a little bit more of a superhero flair. If you're working in a horror mode, you know, give it that that sort of flair. I uh, you know, my most recent example I guess is I, I was sitting down writing an issue with Daredevil and I, I had nothing. I was sat down that it was a Saturday afternoon, I had nothing I'm just trying to jot down notes and come up with something, and that's when the George Zimmerman verdict came in. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly I had a Daredevil story. So, you know, you sort of go out. And I think if you looked at it, especially from hindsight, you wouldn't necessarily recognize it as a direct commentary on the Zimmerman case, but it informed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, absolutely. That happens all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did a, a Fantastic Four story I did when I was in the FF in 89 or 90, somewhere in there. And I had a, the FF travel to. Uh, essentially alternate Earths without realizing it initially. <clears throat> and one of their clues was that they discovered that the President of the United States was Dan Quayle, who was the Vice President at that time. And so I, I kind of went from there and then I went into a kind of weird Stalin story um, that had Stalin as kind of this preserved, project or whatever, preserved guy, ancient, still alive. So I borrow from history like that or invent my own and use tropes from actual history not all the time, but about, right now I'm in Norse, Norse gods, so I don't really, I'm not borrowing too much from current stuff. It depends really on the comic book, but contemporary comics, contemporary superheroes, um, you're always aware of what's going on in the news. I'm not always trying to make direct comments on what's happening, but obviously I have opinions about stuff that's going on. I don't normally share that stuff exactly, I'm not trying to write political tracts, but uh, you know, the way the world is informs the way any writer does yeah. his job whether it's in comics or novels or movies or anything like that. It's more, more directly, less directly at the times. But I've certainly done that in my own work. And I think with comics, because they, they come out quick, very quickly. Yes. Um, so they're, they're coming out monthly or bi-monthly. So they're just more immediate. So they're just more immediate, where a novel can take five or six years to write. And you can go back and change things. With, with this, it's, it's always out there. All right. and, and there's kind of a feedback yes. loop too between what you do in the comics and then maybe how you're influencing the culture. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, then, then you reflect the influenced culture. So it's really, I think that's very cool actually. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's extremely cool. Well, one thing in terms of pop culture right now, <clears throat> I did Thor 30 years ago for Marvel. A lot more people know who Thor is right now than they knew 30 years ago and did the comic book because of the films. People who never read the comic, but part of the feedback loop. So he would be in the popular consciousness now in a way that was not true 30 years ago. And it's really because the comics got started and then the movies picked up. And, and there were some bad cartoons years ago as well. They didn't have such a big effect on the popular culture. But the movies, the Marvel movies especially, had an enormous effect on people being aware of that stuff. So the Norse myths in general, not necessarily known with accuracy, but they would know the names, people would know the names of a lot of those characters in a way that was not true 10 years ago. And by the way, these two are in the first Thor movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Recently. <laughs> about a nanosecond. Yeah, you can see me yeah, peeking up over the top of the screen like that. But it's so cool. <laughs> they look awesome. All right, so let's just talk about the 1930s. Um, you've got the Great Depression. You've got immigrants being vulnerable. Uh, Jewish people were depending on local ethnic institutions. They didn't have a lot of resources. There's a lot of trust lost within the communities, urban crime is spreading, and there's this looming threat of war. So what happens? 1938, Superman is created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. They were children of Jewish immigrants. The Jewish community needed a savior. So in the early days, he was a vigilante. He took the law into his own hands. In his first appearance, he saves a woman from um, the electric chair. He beat up a wife beater. He went after crooked mine owners, slum lords. He defended the poor and the oppressed. 
he was an outsider and he needed to acclimate to a new culture, so he posed as a Gentile, it changed his name, and it was a crusader for social justice. Um, so all of these things were happening. He was, here you can see he's crusading, um, he was an illegal immigrant. You can see this reaction to urban crime. Here's, you know, Batman's coming along. I'm just trying to go through here quickly. So this is what these, these characters were for. They were for defending people who couldn't defend themselves. Um, I'm trying to get through quickly so we can talk to these people. These are awesome. 1940s, the first half of the 40s was consumed by the war. Pearl Harbor, Japanese people were sent to internment camps. You have artists and intellectuals coming here um, from other countries. Women had to go to work outside the home in the factories when the men were off at war. After the war, the heroes returned home, and so did the women. But they had tasted independence. And then teenagers were also born, not like born, but the idea of teenagers was born. Because um, there were available jobs and there was money to be earned. So here you have a lot of patriotic superheroes. Even Uncle Sam, he did more than recruit. You know, he went out and fought. And he's tearing across the swastika. So 1941, you have Captain America. He's one of the first and the splashiest of the patriotic heroes. Uh, he debuted punching Hitler in the face even before we were at war. Um, so Captain America was created by giving him a super soldier serum by Dr. Reinstein, who was assumed to be from Germany in a time when intellectuals were fleeing to the US. So you have Wonder Woman. Women needed replacement in factories. We had big male superheroes, but no real significant female superhero. So we have the creation of Wonder Woman. We also, here's Wonder Woman for president, woohoo. We also had rampant um, racism. Superman hated the Japanese. He hated the Germans. Um, there's a lot of things going on here. But we also, here he is beating up both of his terrible pictures. Um, we see he's a racist here. That's Superman's lowest moment. Here he is. Here <laughs> he is. Yes, he's going to disguise himself as a, he's as gonna, a Jap. You, can't, you guys can't see, but it's a, it's a Sunday strip where he decides to disguise himself as a jab. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it was, it, it, but it was a reflection of a culture. Exactly. It was and, a reflection and, of what was and what was considered patriotic at the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was going to be a hero and a spy, I yes. assume. Exactly. Yes. Right. Also, it's not unusual, really, if you're fighting someone, generally, culturally, you demonize them. Yep. Um, you can see that today. Uh, pretty easily yeah, in you America. Don't, you don't think of um, them as people because if they're people like you, well, then you don't really necessarily want to kill them. Mm -hmm. So that's just that's just the way it is, and that's what yeah. that's what part of what war is about. It's one of the bad parts about it, where it, we make there no good parts, but they're one of the bad parts, which is the, you you have to make the people that you're fighting really less than you are, less than human, perhaps. Yeah. And I, this is just an example of it. So it's not unusual. It's maybe early early in comics what happened is maybe the first war we fought since comic books were had evolved, had become a, uh, a medium, but it's not unusual and it's still, you still get some of that in comics mm -hmm. today. Right, but there were much more propaganda engines yes. back yes. in the day. There were very, comics were very much propaganda and engines. deliberately so. Yes. I mean, a lot of these comics eventually were, I mean, the, went to the GIs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There was a lot lots of, of them were the GIs. So. I think, think, what, 75% of them, I think. Went over at, to the GIs. At, at its height, it was something like 70 to 75 percent of these yeah. comics were going overseas to our fighting men in the trenches, and so and, of course and you want to pump them up. Sure, and you want them to think of the people that they are being sent there to slaughter as not people. Yep. So there are also other kinds of racism going on. Um, it's kind of crazy, but we have also again this shows the point that you were making. You know, the real superheroes are here. What happens is the real superheroes come home and the women return home, but they had tasted independence. The family farms weren't the ideal anymore. You have the GI, GI Bill, people can go to college. Um, so we, we have this problem with, with women wanting to now work outside the home. Um, she be, here's, Wonder Woman was actually, became a character. She was in All-Star Comics, and the first time she joins the Justice Society, she's the secretary. Um, while the men are off at war, um, Wonder Woman's gonna be the secretary. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> but they let her in the clubhouse. She got to sign all the things, you know, she signed Diana Prince here, which kind of gives away her secret <laughs> identity. <laughs> so I can never quite understood that. <laughs> Because it says Wonder Woman under in parentheses underneath. <laughs> okay. So we also have teenagers. We have teens having more money and freedom. Baby boomers, they're now like seven, eight, nine years old. You've got the white picket fences, because television says that that's that's what life is supposed to be like. But you still have communism and the fear of communism. Um, we have a lot of crime going on. Um, so crime comics are very in, in popular um, things are crime does not pay does not pay is really small because they want to like really push push that crime um, okay um, actually I also want to mention that in 1948 one out of every eight comics was a crime comic that's how big the crime thing was um, mid 1950s we have the comics code authority and it's basically put in place to stop those horror and crime comics uh, but it impacted other things too. Um, this whole idea of you need to respect your parents, you need to obey your parents, respect elders. You know, children can be seen, not heard. And as you always point out, that basically the comics code was put into place to stop Bill Gaines, who was. It was yeah, it was basically put in, in place to stop EC Comics, which were the main purveyors of horror comics of the day. They were awesome. They were terrific. <laughs> they, they were, were amazing. Awesome. I know. <laughs> and by the way, so tepid by today's standards, yes, and yet. But so other publishers got together and said, well, how do we try these guys out of business? Well, we'll come up with an internal code you know, of conduct that we pretend is to protect the children, but really just to drive games out of business. And one, one note about the EC, and Mark can probably speak to this better. I'm not as much of a historian on this stuff. But the EC comics, in many ways, were the suburban nightmares of the GIs coming back from the war. Yeah. They're really nightmare comics about the underside. Now, they don't have directly address stuff like post-traumatic stress syndrome, I mean, that, that, that stuff wasn't around by those terms at the time, but they were very much about the suburb guys coming home to the suburbs, the supposed American dream, and having it go wrong. And they were in some ways in that regard kind of insightful about it, and kind of, I mean, that... It, it was it, maybe a slightly exaggerated version. Well, for sure, I mean, it was just, you know, they had eight pages or whatever they were, and usually, I know, Henry Twist ending. But they were pretty grim about it, and they didn't pull any punches about it. It was a lot of it was metaphorical, um, but that's really what that, what I think anyway, what those comics were about in large part, especially the horror comics. Yeah, they had science fiction comics, and then they they tried other stuff when they were starting being driven out of business. They tried you know, what Ace Ace is High or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, psych psychology, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts. I think about what a great comic that's got to be. I can't wait to read some guy on the couch getting psychoanalyzed. So they tried a number of different things, but that's really where that stuff was coming from at the time. Yeah. So it did, in fact, reflect the culture. In some ways, I think it kind of reflected the culture, or part of the culture, that a lot of other people didn't really want to see. So they were able to kind of drive it out of business in a way that made it harder to find that stuff for a while. Honestly, one of the problems with those comics is that they were so beautifully drawn. Yeah. They, they were really well done. And that made them particularly attractive, I think. Yeah, I think so. Oh, had some phenomenal artists. Mm -hmm. So here's an example um, from the Bill Gaines um, in, her, what, in, in court. They held up this crime book here, um, suspense stories with the women's this, Yeah, so during congressional hearings yes. where they were trying to determine whether comics were deleterious to the youth of the day. And they asked him, do you find this in good taste? And he said, for a horror comic, yes. Yeah. So that was probably not. Mm -hmm. It would be in bad taste if the head were being held higher, I think. Or something exactly. Like that. He said exactly. If the head were held higher, you could see blood dripping from the neck. That would that's that would far. be in bad taste. Yeah. Perhaps but not the best answer. We don't no. know that her that's her body. That's just, there, but just speculation. <laughs> so I don't know if there's a good answer to that question. Once, yeah. once you get into the good taste idea, yeah. these, are, these are horror comics. Of course, yeah. they're not in good right. taste. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would the point be? So. The comics code comes in, you can see the difference, the before and after picture here of what they have to do, which is kind of fun. Um, a lot of books are being burned. Um, but there's also this fear of communism. Um, and it's everywhere, it's hidden among us. Enemies are hidden among us. The church got involved, they put out a, uh, 
a book called The Treasure Chest, the Catholic Church. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. used to get those. I'm 12 years old Catholic school. This me. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, get treasure, we would get treasure chests when they came out. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a story, there's a story called this godless communism. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we were well indoctrinated. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this going on. Um, so we have people to to fight communism. Um, Captain America. We have science fiction going on. Um, the U.S. Sat uh, satellite is successfully orbiting Earth. So this is science fiction comics become very popular because of this. But it also shows us that there's enemies everywhere. You've got the mystery in space comics and all these things. Um, weird fantasy. You've got all these crazy things going on. And all of these monsters, they're representing really the enemy. They're representing communism. You can't really put, I'm going to fight communism and punch it in the face. So you have to put that in to something like one of these monsters. Um, even Jimmy Olsen got involved here and was out outer space. It's Jimmy from Jupiter. So what happens when they attack? This is this is what we're going to find out, you know, in all of these books. But what 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 is here to save us is Batman and Superman. They're all going to save us from all of these creatures. They're going to save us from communism. Poor Robin. Yeah, and all like all superheroes were fighting aliens at the time because that was the allegory for communism. That was yes. the allegory for the strangers out there. Also, you could get aliens past the comics code. That's yes. true. Yes. That made aliens weren't real. Or they also weren't monsters. Yeah, you couldn't or do, do zombies. Yeah. Zombies. Yeah. Do, you no. do zombies. We couldn't use any. Yes. You couldn't use the word zombie. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure why. So at least at Marvel, they came up with the word Zvembi, which apparently was good enough to get past the comics code. I, oh, yeah, the comics code was really weird. Yes. It was very strange. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, uh, I just hey, you're, you're back. You're back. Just doing weird things. It's a communist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just doing it again. Perfect. Okay. I'll go quickly. So there's this huge fear, and it's all over. It's, it's atomic war. Only a strong American can, can prevent this. So you have this all over, and it's a real fear. Um, these are these are real books that were put out. These civil defense manuals and things about this is what we need to do. Oh yeah, well, you can save yourself from an atomic attack when you're a child. If you're in a school, the word comes out there's a nuclear attack. You run out in the hall and put your ass to the wall and put your head <laughs> under your arm, hands and yeah. kneel down, and yeah. you're going to be okay when the blast passes. Yeah, yeah. That's, I did those exercises. Hide under your desk. Yeah. I mean, yep. How did you? Yeah, Lucky was I think like the Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta. It was the, like the the third likeliest place to be bombed by an atom bomb. And even as a little kid, I realized that you know they drop a bomb on Atlanta, duck it and cover, and ain't going <laughs> to do nothing. You're talking about getting left behind. Oh, oh yeah. We had these drills. We had a drill once where everyone was going to be evacuated and practice evacuation. And they didn't have enough buses, so I got left behind. <laughs> so I was obviously going to be fried one way or the other. The extra, the extra kid we didn't need. <laughs> well, they didn't even have a be television commercial. There's a movie called The Atomic Cafe, yeah. which is a, just a collection of all the documentary stuff going on back at the time. It's not even everything, it's, but it's a lot of it. And there was stuff I remember watching. There would be public service announcements on television, and they would explain what to do in case of a nuclear attack. And the, the thing was that, for example, you were going to get a big flash of light. You get that big flash of light, that means the bomb's going off somewhere. And you have seconds to do something. So they have mom and dad and a couple of their kids are out having a picnic. They, they lay down the cloth, they have the picnic. There's this big flash of light. Everybody instantly grabs the picnic cloth, flips it up in the air, flips all of it, and then dives under the cloth and pulls it back out. And the idea, I believe, now we're not, not nothing in the these commercials discuss radiation or fallout or any of that stuff. But the idea was that in the nuclear blast, there was going to be this flash of incredible heat that was going to blow by. But it blows by incredibly quickly. So if you're shielded for the moment when it comes through, you'll be better than if you weren't shielded. I don't know exactly how that's going to work out. But there were things like little Bobby is riding his bicycle, delivering papers down the street in the suburbs. There's a big flash. Bobby is off his bike in a heartbeat hides behind the wall or does something. There were you know, various things to teach you what you should do in case of a nuclear attack. And actually, we know somebody whose father was in Tokyo or, or Hiroshima, Hiroshima when, um, yeah, when, when one of the bombs went off. He was, he was a, a child who was riding his bike. And when it flashed, he fell off his bike into a ditch, and the heat blast went right past him, and he lived. Wow. wow. So um, that's. 
I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't work. Cover might have worked, you know, <laughs> depending on how close you were to the bomb. But again, I don't know what the radiation stuff and other things that go on in nuclear explosions. Um, but that's that was kind of the thinking of the time. The comics, and of course, there's, there's, of course, fallout shelters, which you know many people had built in their basements, and you had like two or three weeks worth of food and canned goods, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. That was all that stuff was pretty standard. One of my friends' dads put that put a big railroad car and dug a big hole and stuck a railroad car into his into his backyard and filled it with supplies. So that when you know Atlanta, we were in Atlanta. It was yeah. about third boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he was all set for the. The nuclear holocaust. Wow. And you never had any parties down there. Never did. Never. No, actually, we never did. Really, you never did? Okay. No. Honestly, what were we thinking? I, mean, anyway. I know. <laughs> I mean, this is the world of our childhood. Yeah. Really, what yes, it is. It is. Long, so, long ago. So, in, in the comics, this is how this is giving these reptiles and, and aliens and monsters, or they're giving us something tangible to fight. We can't fight. We can't fight against that, but we can fight against these creatures. And there were a lot of monsters, a lot. And Orgo, <laughs> who is my favorite? Orgo is the unconquer unconquerable. All right, and there's also the strange fascination with ants during this time. <laughs> <laughs> Giant ants were, I was gonna say were huge, but that's kind of <laughs> um, But they were, they were huge. They loved their ants. What year was the comic? I, I can't say this anyway, but the year of the comic you're showing is when? Yeah, 1953. And was it 54 when them, them came out? Yeah. 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 You know, James Ants. Ants and Giant Ants. Yeah. And Ants. So, but giant, like giant, giant anything giant at that time in the whole yeah. 50s, there was a whole series of movies, some good, some not quite well, so good, reflecting of giant creatures. Well, the, I was, you know, atomic science, mutations. it was science, atomic mutations. Yeah. And, yeah. Science yeah. gone wrong. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff was happening. So the 60s, things change a little bit. It's age of youth. Baby boomers become teenagers. There's 70 million teens. Young people want to change. Colleges were the place to make it happen. You've got the bell jar to kill a mockingbird, feminine mystique. It's age of science. Um, oh, here's the youth movement here. Flash. Get out of here, Flash. <laughs> more, more campus protests. And you have campus protectors. Man. One quick note, I thought, yes. just to interject for a moment, because we may be past it already, but if you go back and look at the origins of Marvel Comics as superheroes, you will find that many of the superheroes in the or at Marvel's origins were fighting communism. Yeah. And it was no longer communism, not necessarily disguised as monsters, sometimes they were, but there are things like Thor fighting the Commissar, right. who was, a, I think, Chinese, red Chinese, I think. And there were, of course, Tony Stark, uh, his whole war kid. Yeah. He was always predicated on Vietnam, I think, yeah. in the original. They moved that sense, because of course he's not that old. But it was, it was, pretty, it was over in Vietnam. Yeah. So a lot of those characters really, there was a very strong anti communist uh, plot element to many of the early Marvel superheroes that kind of went away over time. But the early ones are very strongly uh, anti red. Yeah, that's a good point. This is why. All right, so we have a lot of campus protesters. We have hippies going on. You know, Superman's a freak out. We hate money. Um, so we've got all this going on. Uh, more hippies, beatniks. I got to tell you, as a kid, I guess as a kid of that age, when Marvel and the other companies were putting out the hippie comics and war protesters, I would just cringe. Because <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I knew guys that were doing that stuff. I knew guys that were hippies. I knew other stuff, and none of that stuff seemed to have any verisimilitude in the comic. I mean, I knew guys, nobody was really dressing in bearskin rugs and a lot of other stuff that was kind of going on in the drawing. But the drawing and the writing was all being done by guys who were an older generation. Yeah, oh yeah. And it's, it's hard to look back. I, mean, I would have a lot of trouble right now writing drawing stories of whatever the youth generation, is, whatever the hell's going on in the youth generation. Ah, youth, ah, what do I care? Ah. But it would be, it'd be tough to do that stuff for me now. That's why I'm doing Norris Smiths or a thousand years old. Nobody can go back and say, ah, you're wrong, you bum. So, but it was true at the time. I remember that's about when I quit buying some of the, some of the yeah, I won't I'll mention any, any names, but when there were comics of like war projects and some other stuff, it seemed so fake. So, and somehow it didn't, it, you know, it was odd because when I read early Spider-Mans and Peter and his friends were all going out for a cup of Java. <laughs> Nobody had a cup of Java when I was a kid in like 30 years already, but yeah. or 40, 20 years. But yeah, I let that slide. That was I understood it was supposed to be hip, and I don't know what do I care. But when they kind of got more and more trying to do comics in some ways that were more relevant, and there was a movement in the late 60s 
to do comics that were more relevant to whatever the world was about. Green Lantern, Green Arrow is a good example of that, with Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams trying to do comics that really reflected what was going on in society right then in a lot of ways. Um, there was a movement to try and do that. Yeah. And it, it, it was done, as you can imagine, with a varying degree. But at um, least, but young people had a voice. I mean, the, the yeah. thing is, they did. It, comics were such a considered such a, a slum for creators. Like you didn't want to be known as in the '30s and '40s and '50s as oh, a yeah. person who did comics because that was a you know they were so ill thought of by society. So you really didn't have anybody, any new creators getting into comics in the 19 in the 1940s, 1950s. Was, so the time you get to the 1960s is a bunch of old white guys. And you finally have, in the mid-60s, you finally have Roy Thomas and Denny O'Neill and folks like that. Finally, the first wave ever of people who grew up reading comics. Archie Goodwin. Archie. You know, uh, the first group of people who actually grew up reading comics, saying, I want to be part of this. Yeah. And, so, and, and so these people, you know, they obviously they, they had different concerns than the 50-year-old white guys down the hall running the place. Steve Skates, guys like that, Steve, and then you get in the 70s and Steve Gerber and Steve Hart, other guys named, not, named, not named Steve, um, <laughs> Carlin, doing... Marvin you know, Webb. Yeah, exactly, yes. And it's doing, just doing things that were a lot more personal and, and again, trying to, trying to make the world outside their window look a little, outside the superhero's window, look a little more like the world outside our window, so. Yeah. So we still had some of the old guys still there, yeah. as you can see in the chauvinism here, you know, don't get too near them, darling. Stop sounding like a wife and find me that gun lady, <laughs> which when I would go, find your own gun. Yeah. Um, music was big, you know, you've got rock, Oh, that band, rock music the that, kids listen to. That yeah. rock music. Uh, psychedelics come in, you've got Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, kind of written for the older crowd. Um, pop art is, is big. Marvel pop art production. Yeah, that lasted which, for like six months. Six months, yeah. I think. That was, yeah. a, that was a little low that they put on the corner in the yeah. corner box of Marvel when pop art was hot. So they jumped on that. Yeah. Usually, our, our feeling at the time, somewhere just after that, was that when when Marvel got into a trend, it meant the trend had peaked already. Yeah. And when DC got into the trend, it meant the trend was dead. Yeah. <laughs> that was just our feeling. I, I nothing about DC or Marvel on that, but that's kind of how we felt about. It. By the time when Kung Fu comics came out from Marvel, there were a lot of Kung Fu movies coming in. The first ones were coming in 75 or thereabouts, I think. Yeah. I think Five Fingers of Death was the first one. A bunch of us went down to Times Square. At that time when Times Square had not been Disney-fied, but there were enough of it, so it didn't really matter. I went to see Five Fingers of Death, which was terrible, but we, we all loved it. We were wowed by the kind of Kung Fu, Hong Kong action flick we'd never seen before. A kind of movie we'd never seen. And then Marvel got their master of Kung Fu going, and by the time DC got their Kung Fu comics going, that was it, it was over. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got all your conscious uh, objectors, you know. Uh, yeah, the Silver Surfer was Silver the first, Surfer. was the comics first conscientious objector. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy who was the analog, it was Kirby's way, I, I don't know this, but I'm projecting that it was Kirby's, Kirby's, Jack Kirby's way of saying, you know, there are kids who don't agree with the war. Mm -hmm. And they deserve to have their voices heard. And Silver Surfer, when you look at it through that lens, that he was a Vietnam a conscientious objector. Like, I don't want to do a Galactus. I don't want to purge the world like Galactus wants me to. I, I see value here. I see value to life. Uh, you have uh, a lot of things going on with the wonders of science. This is the age of science. You've got Flash, Adam, X-Men, Iron Man. All Hulk. heroes whose origins are predicated purely on science, not on magic right. or fantasy. But it's right. all not good. You have, you know, poor Peter Parker. <coughs> You know, getting turned into Spider-Man, which I know is a good thing. <laughs> um, you've got the space race going on, and it inspires a lot of, of stories. You've got Magneto and Professor X, which um, I, Malcolm X, Professor X and Magneto, who are kind of compared to MLK and Malcolm X, they both want the same thing piece, but it's how they approach it. Um, you have Lobo. Uh, a little bit of racism is seen here. He's the first African American to start his own comic. It lasted two issues. The Southern distributors just said, "We're not going to carry this comic." Book. It was like 19. What did I say? This was 67, 68. 68. I believe. 68. Lobo, the, the the first black that heralded his own comic, and again, distributors in the South said, "No, we're not going to try and carry that." And sadly, as when I was in charge of Boom Comics in 2006, 2007, we came up with 
uh, there was a series called High Rollers, which was uh, basically The Sopranos, but in urban Baltimore with black characters. And even if we had Southern comic book stores say, uh, we can't carry that, we can't sell it to our audience. That was horrifying that we had we gone Actually, It wasn't that their ago. audience wouldn't buy it, it was that they didn't want their audience to look at it? They were just afraid that there would be... It might give people ideas? That they might just, it might, <laughs> something like that. I mean, some of them were, God. I know, I know, and that was heartbreaking to think, oh, yeah. we've, got, we've gotten nowhere during that time. So, you know, the next thing you know, we'll have a black president. <laughs> so in our army at war, race didn't matter. So you have some things happening that are good. In the end, in Robert Kaniger was a the writer and editor of the War Comics at DC, and you know for all of his weirdness and unpleasantness in some ways, he was a brilliant writer, and he really was uh, you know a, a warrior against racism for for DC Comics. He really his his characters he would he would very heavily lean on racial issues, but in the most positive, most liberal way. Like, this, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're, what, is the, what is the color of my blood? Is that the name of the story? Yeah. Is that, is the, sure. I mean, just to say, you know, when a black GI gives a white GI transfusion, and people are a little upset about this, but it, the point is, blood is blood. All right, 70s, we have Watergate, we have Vietnam, we have the, this disillusionment of the government, we have women, we have gays and minorities demanding equality, the youth is coming of age and questioning authority still. There's a social consciousness going on, but there's also things like starvation and an explosion in population that we can see in the comics. So, yes, Sergeant Rock. Vietnam style, Vietnam, yeah. yeah. Equality. Equality is my favorite Lois Lane cover where she's tearing off the Superman's girlfriend. Because of course that had to be Superman was what mattered in the Lois Lane story, so it was called Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane. Um, but she's like, I'm done. And she put it back. Um, you have women's lib going on, which is great. You've got this going on, which is kind of crazy. Um, this is when Wonder Woman, her powers were taken away. Denny O'Neill did this. He did this because he, he was giving her more power, saying she doesn't need superpowers to be this powerful woman. But that is not how it came across to all the other readers and Gloria Steinem. Um, they did not like this, and they said it's our one superhero, our one female superhero, and you made her not a superhero. Um, she had fabulous clothes, though, during She that time. did? I was going to say. Um, <laughs> no. I actually kind of liked that period. I, I, I have to. I got to say, Gloria Stein, not was that, never met her. She, I'm sure she's wonderful. But I got to say, that was my favorite Wonder Woman comic. Oh. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Mike Sikowski, yeah. I think, was the guy yes. who was involved yeah. in writing yes. and drawing that. Well, you she, know, the stories were good. That's the stories the story. were good. And the, were, and the clothes, clothes were good. And I think modeled to some extent. to some extent after Modesty Blaze and New York. Yes, yeah, it English was. And Emma Peel, actually. And That's one of them. And Peel, where there were women who were kicking ass and taking names. And, and I, not honestly, superhero. I can see Gloria Steinem's point. I really sure. The, yeah. I can, but you know, they were really hoping to encourage female independence, and she was smart and a super spy and could dress. Um, yeah. So, but but it was a problem. But she was still powerful. She could still beat people up. But they were like, well, she learned from a guy. She learned from a man. So there was all this. But you have all sorts of other things happening in Green Lantern. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but it says this this man's telling Green Lantern, I've been reading about you, how you work for the blue skins, and how on a planet someplace you helped out the orange skins, and you done considered able for the purple skins. Only there's some skins you never bothered with, the black skins. I want to know how come. Answer me that, Mr. Green Lantern. So these things are coming into the comics. And, and again, the comics at this point still targeted to eight, 10, 12 year old kids, especially DC Comics. Um, and as somebody who was exactly the right age for that, yes, that on the face of it today, a sequence like that, you know, what have you done for the black skins, seems like hit, being hit over the head with a mallet, you know, in terms of its subtlety, but it wasn't meant to be subtle. And it did make, a, it did make an impression on me at that age. And it did sort of make me aware of a world where not everybody would look like a mirror reflection of me. There are a lot of ethnicities being represented. Color being color. represented, the people of color being represented in color, put on covers for the first time when 
I, I, I looked once. I went down and did the, re, did the looking at it. If you don't count like baggage porters on trains and stuff, mm -hmm. the first time a black man showed up in a Superman comic was 1970. Yeah. It took that long. And it's not, and again, not a criticism of, it, it's just the way of the time, but it's just that, that was other faces, other ethnicities, unless they were rank stereotypes, were just not shown in American comics. And the 70s changed that. Yeah. Well, Lois Lane does the I Am Curious Black. If you have not read this issue, you should. It's great. I'm not going to tell you the ending, but you kind of want to go Superman. Um, it's also is not inspired by a novel that was out. Yes. Or not a novel, a uh, uh, the, movie. The movie. Reality book. Well, there was a book, which was, well, I'm Curious Yellow, which Yellow. was right. and, yeah. and Blue, but there was also, there's a book about that time called Black Like Me, right. yes. which a white okay. guy. I mean, now it's very difficult to do that. Right. And But there was still an attempt to try and figure out, in a sense, I guess, what the black experience in America was like yeah. when you're white and you don't know. Right. And so this guy disguised himself essentially in some way. I never read the book. I worked in a bookstore, so I became pseudo literate. I read all the bats of millions of books. And people would say, How about this book about the Tibetan flagpole sitter? That, uh, like, oh, yeah, that's this book, and it's right. And I said, Wow, he knows all this stuff. I just read the backs of the books. <laughs> but, this, but it came, you know, I, I seemed very smart. But that was one of the books that was out. I forgot the guy, the name of the author. But, so there were things like that, again, not only in the comic books, but in the culture in yes. general. Yeah. These kind of explorations of what's the black experience like in America, particularly if you're not black. Right. And, and how can you get a handle on what that's about, really? which was at that time really unique. I mean, yeah. it was really very difficult, almost impossible. And this is in a world where you don't have, you don't have the World Wide Web, you don't have Wikipedia, yeah. you don't have all the access to information, good or bad, right. that you would have now. It's not a 24-hour news cycle. No. Right. Nothing like that. You know, you had six, eight, six television stations in major markets if you were lucky, mm -hmm. and fewer in smaller markets. So yeah. it was a very different, that, the information end of things at that time was really different. Really and the way you got information was quite different than it is now. It's hard to, hard to explain even really. Uh, we've got religious comics with Archie, uh, spreading the word. We're, we've got what you were talking about earlier, ignoring the code. Um, the comics code is kind of threw it out the window. Um, oh. oh, I had I one thing about that. Yeah. There's a, well, that's the Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Yeah. I will say the, com the comics code was still floating around at that point, and it was still in somewhat in force. I mean, it was beginning to be a little less when DC decided to do a drug story with Green Arrow and Speedy as Ward, whatever he was. Um, they went through the comics code and worked out a way of doing that story that the code would find acceptable. It included stuff, I believe, like on the cover, not showing maybe the spoon or some of the some of the some of the some of the, some the, the paraphernalia yeah. couldn't yeah. be shown on the cover, but they could still do a story with that stuff on the inside. Yeah. Um, I think at the time Marvel got wind of it. I think did their comic come out first. Their Spider Man came first. Yeah. Actually, yeah. The, the story I got was that Marvel had about it. Went, <laughs> and, whipped their, <laughs> and they whipped the Spider Man story out, like a two or three parter about yeah. drug use and. They did not bother with the comics code. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. They didn't bother going through the code. As a result, the code withheld their stamp. There's a little seal that goes in the covers of all the comics code books. That seal was withheld from those covers. And as far as anybody could tell, it didn't make a damn bit of difference in the sales. The real clout that this code had at the time, up to that point, was if a comic did not have the code seal, there were a lot of retailers that would not carry it. So the clout was economic. Right. It, was basically, it was basically self censorship. If right. you don't have this, we're not going to put your book out there. And distribution is always one of the yes. oh, yeah. of comic books. Yeah, of anything, getting it out there and that's, to find it. And that's really what it was all about. Because if you ever met, if, if you or your parents or grandparents ever met anybody who didn't buy a comic for their kid because it didn't have the comics code seal on it, find me and tell me. Because I would love to meet uh, yeah, that no, yeah. no one in the history of comics has ever. In the history of parents has ever gone, well, that doesn't have the comics code seal on it. I'm but, not buying it. But in the wake of this stuff, this kind of stuff, somewhere in the mid-70s, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Starlin was doing, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this was Captain Marvel, I think. Captain Marvel, who was, you know, in Jim's version, was cosmically aware. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but if you read his <laughs> comics, you can figure it out. And, and so Jim was, I gather he did this in production himself. And what he did was on the cover of his comic, where it said the comics code, he reversed a couple of letters. And when it came out, it was approved by the cosmic 
code. <laughs> and there was a fair amount of kerfluffle about that at the time when it happened. So, yeah, nobody noticed it until Nobody noticed it until it was already out. It didn't get, get, awesome. get, 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 get to bed proofreaders and got out there into the real world. We thought it was hysterical. People who were older than us didn't think it was quite there. The companies weren't so amused by it, but we still thought it was a riot. But it was, I mean, it was a necessary evil that no one really took seriously. Mm. It was, do you, know why, do you know why it's in the shape of a stand? No. Because, and I want to say it was Irish Knapp, I'm trying to remember who it was who did the design on it. It was one of DC's mm -hmm. in-house guys. Um, Pick the stamp as the shape because, as he put it, people don't look at stamps. Like you ignore them on letters, you ignore them on stuff, and so we wanted something that would just fade yeah, as just much in the background away. as they possibly could. Wow. I thought that was great. One more element of cover you'd like to not have people want to see. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot of social consciousness, starving countries, paying for your crimes, pollution, population increases. Population like explosion. Yeah. yeah. So in all of these, and a lot of it was in Green Lane and Green Arrow, and it had to do with what? Luke, Luke Cage. Oh. That's right. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I was like, excuse That's sweet, there? sweet Christmas. He's over there. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke Cage is the first African-American character to start in his own book and succeed. And succeed. And then, of course, you can't mention the 70s without <laughs> disco. disco. So, Dazzler. It was a desert cosplayer yesterday. I was, no kidding. And even Superman's getting down. Yeah. Clark dancing. Yeah. She had the disco ball and everything. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. All right, 80. Oh, we're running behind. We'll go I quick. think she was designing with Bo Derek originally. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. They were going to do a movie with Bo Derek, who was yeah. very popular at the time. Yeah. And that's the dancer who was kind of created to be Bo Derek. Yeah. Um, or to have her in that role. Uh, <laughs> But time went by, that didn't happen. When the comic finally came out, they had to redraw the face, so it wasn't Bill Derek's face on the character. Also, once more, the trend on the way out. Kind of dead. Yeah. Kind of dead about that. We're pretty close. So in the 80s, we have the Me, Me, Me generation. There are hostile takeovers, MTV, The Gap. Started letting people dress the same. Um, so you've got Lex Luthor here. AIDS was a big story that brought homosexuality and sex to the front. Um, so we've got all lots of different stories about that. Even Extrano, who is DC's first gay superhero, mm -hmm. Extraño, <laughs> which is every stereotype you could get Imaginable. in one character. Um, like every gay I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have the Challenger exploding. This is in the comics. You have Thatcherism. Actually, the Challenger exploding. I think John wasn't he doing Superman right yeah. then, and he had originally had a scene in one of his first issues, the very first, first. yeah, it was going to be the space shuttle, and, right? and he was yeah. saving the space shuttle, and the Challenger disaster happened, so he had to go back and I think alter the art, yeah. and it did something that was not too dissimilar, but they had to make sure it wasn't that. So that was like news feedback that went back into the comic yeah. and altered the comic. That this is the tragedy of the Challenger. Yeah. So you've got all of this going on. I'm trying to move on quickly. 1990s, you know, violence and sex and scandals are dominating the news. Globalization, television's really pushing the envelope with sex and violence and bad language. Um, and you kind of get the sexification of comics at this time. Um, image went off. They created their own line of comics. And as Mark Wade puts it, hormone-driven guys um, in the mid. In their mid twenties, and they're super sexifying women to a degree that they. That you I've never see. seen waists that narrow. <laughs> no, no. Well, or other like, things as well. Oh, but no. I'll stay in the waist. Yeah, all, all of the guys were all steroided up too. They yeah. were. I mean, yes. Yeah, it's just the women. Oh yeah, not just the women. It's just you can see Sue Storm here, where she's in her costume like everybody else, and then they put her in this costume next to her, which looks like Meg Ryan as a stripper, which is just not right. Um, then you've got the, the, the boobs of prey here. Um, so, but you, again, men are also very large too. Uh, the 2000s, 2010s, you've got gay rights, social media, racial issues, 9-11. 9-11 is widely represented in the comics, one of the greatest covers ever, love that. Um, Super Obama, he's made his way into comics. Um, we're still fighting terrorism, so CAP has something to do. We have gay marriage, which is still going on, coming in. We've got Don't Ask, Don't Tell, 
um, from uh, Batwoman Elegy. We've got Kevin Keller. It was one of the Archies, and boy, they got a lot of heat for oh, having yes. a, an openly gay character because you know groups like One Million Moms, which are 75 angry housewives, yes. um, <laughs> you know, holding protests and stuff because how dare you introduce gay you know, my children to gay characters, which is, again, absurd. So yes. it's a good way to be behind the times. You have social media. Again, you know, what's great? Where does Superman change anymore? Um, <laughs> you've got Insufferable, where one of the superheroes uses Twitter and his Twitter followers to help him fight crime. Um, as you were talking about earlier, this is the Daredevil issue with Trayvon Martin. Yes. He's absolutely represented. And I think even 10 years from now, you'll be able to see it. You have gender issues going on um, to where instead of being sexified, you know, we've got uh, teams of women characters. And that's it. And I'll leave some room for questions or comments from this panel. All right. How about a question, Mr. Gentleman? You, you got his hand up in a nanosecond. I, know. I, I, think, I, I think maybe we should take his question. Right. Shield. Yeah. Shield in the 60s, 70s was a super spy. You know, um, nowadays, Kind of post ultimate shield is a giant industrial military complex with uh, they're assholes. I mean, that's really <laughs> just you go and say, and, 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 uh, yeah, are they good guys? Like, they, they can they have surveillance, they can read everything. You know? I try, yeah, I, try, I sort of tried to skirt around it in my shield comics, yeah. but the reality is that the way shield is portrayed in comics is sadly the way it would be in real, the way it is in real life, where. Everything is surveilled. Everything is government, you know, oversight. Everything is, you know, Big Brother is watching you, and you do that under the guise of yes, but we do it to make you safe. You know, I, who had phenomenal powers, but did not make himself dictator of the earth, right. as he could easily have done right. at that. And that's true of all superheroes, because you believe in the optimism of what they represented, and that the fact that they were essentially incorruptible. That we believed in the lack of corruption in people that were that powerful. Somewhere after dark, in comic books, and I mean, it's a reflection, I think, again, in real life when we saw things in, in the post Watergate era, which is a little bit earlier, but in things like that, you began to have a great deal of difficulty believing in heroes who would be that selfless right. in their approach to their good deeds. And then you start getting dark and gritty superheroes who go back to doing things that maybe aren't so, aren't always good, or an organization like S.H.I.E.L.D., which suddenly has kind of a dark history. That was not really true. No one knew in the early days of S.H.I.E.L.D. Nobody thought of Nick Fury being a corrupt guy that might use the, use the information in the wrong way. <coughs> Why did write Thor? And, go, and he picks up uh, my first issue, spoiler alert for a comic that was 30 years old. Um, he picks up Don Blake in the car and drives off and tells him to turn back into Thor, basically. And Don's surprised that he knows it, but it's not unlikely or, or surprising that Fury might know something like that and never have revealed it to anybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you'd think, well, a lot of money we made here, or there's a lot of something, you have a whole different dark spin on it. So there is a change, and I think that's a societal change as well, where we see a kind of a darker, more corruptible, and more corrupted society than you might have thought about. I'm not saying it was any better 40, 50 years ago, but it would have been different, and we wouldn't have seen it. The, the popular conception of what you would see yourself in that world was different than what you would see the society now. questions. Um, when you were talking about S.H.I.E.L.D., it made me think uh, about the commercial element. I mean, I don't know, but didn't Marvel introduce S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury and all of that because spies were oh, yeah, for sure. in the 60s? Yeah, and, and that, James Bond and Man from U.N.C.L.E. were the two hottest things going. So, and yeah. that was about I mean, as far Marvel's as it went. show ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so, I guess, how do, you know, how does the commercial element factor into the, the pop the culture element? Well, comics have always jumped on trends. I mean, we talked about it earlier, I mean, sometimes faster than others, but if there's a hot trend out there, some comic book, at least in the old days, probably true now, I don't know as much about comics now as I did then, but they will always hop on one of those, or James Bond or Kung Fu or whatever it is, they always try and find some way to get at that stuff yeah. and make some kind of commercial property. I mean, comics are a business. So they were trying to maximize what they could do, and they were not a high profit business back in the old days. I'm not sure the comic book end is a high profit business now. And certainly, uh, uh, you know, some of the derivatives of comics are a high profit yeah. business. But uh, but comics have always been 
kind of plugged in or tried to plug into whatever's hot right now and yeah. then make something out of it. You can see that because you can see the, the zombies. How many zombie books were there after Walking Dead was big? Every book was a zombie book. Um, right now it's very supernatural, witches kind of things. Those are big. So you just kind of, okay, what's going to be next? You know, so yeah. They, I mean, that's the feedback loop from real life. Yeah. It goes back in the comics where the comics try to reflect many things, not just the societal changes, but the money change. You, you yeah. follow the money. Yeah. Yeah, really. Actually, I think at one point comics had a much tighter loop than it does currently. I mean, there's stories of Jack Kirby, like, you know, saying to Stan, no, I, I'll do all 40 pages myself in a week because I don't want to share my page rate. Uh, and when all the comics community was all in New York City in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and probably up into the early to mid 70s, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm Actually, not sure. about the mid 80s. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure when the exact period when the comics community started breaking out. You, you know, you could conceivably jump on these trends a lot closer as compared to, since if necessary, you know, the editors could grab people by the ears and stuff them all into. Well, maybe I know the bullpen had never really existed right. as though it was portrayed in the comics. I, I, I grant your point, but my counterpoint would be that uh, you have no earthly idea how fast comics are done these days because we're all behind. But thanks, <laughs> but thanks to the internet, we can we, th that shaves off that that the amount of time the loop. For creating a, you know, for getting creating something and getting on the stands, I don't think it's any shorter any longer than it's ever been. If anything, it's probably a little bit shorter because the internet allows us to get stuff in immediately. Oh, the loop is shorter, but, but you've got the you've marketing. got marketing. The yeah. the marketing things months in advance. Sure. You're right. Good point. And all this stuff is promised, and you've got to deliver what's promised, or it can be returned. Exactly. Yes. Also, um, I would say one thing about that is that this is just my own thought. It may not be shared here by anybody else in the panel. But my own thought is that 30 years ago, I did Thor, for example, creativity came from the bottom up, more or less. Yeah. I was given a book like Thor, I was going to do whatever I wanted with it, or within the terms of a mainstream comic book company. So I didn't have crossovers I had to screw That's around with. I didn't have to do all kinds of stuff that tied into lots of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, creativity is often somewhat more from the top down, especially at the big companies, the small ones are a little different. And that meant that you, then they say, okay, you can do your story, but now you're going to be doing a crossover in this month or this this month, or spinning off all this extra stuff off this. And frequently, I think myself, the organizational skill isn't so great that the spine of these kind of crossovers has been really plotted and planned out in a way that makes it possible to do stuff around the edges yeah. without having to alter that stuff at the last possible second and try to fit stuff together. So you, some comics do get produced in an astoundingly short period of time. The internet helps. I mean, people now you can do a page of pencils. You'll scan it. You'll email it to your inker. He'll print it off in blue line. You don't have it's, it's a, you know you shave two two days off the FedEx time it would take to get there. So you can do stuff faster. But because in some ways comics are more top heavy than they used to be, I think it, I think the speed you've gained at the bottom you've lost up at the top. That's fair. Yeah. And, uh, and this was actually discussed in an earlier panel. Uh, comics are non-returnable except when you change the description, right? right? Mm -hmm. If you change the art or you didn't change the description, all of a sudden your content becomes returnable. So if you just suddenly decided to change something and then you put it out, editors are like, what happens if I get returns from this? Yeah, if, 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 if the retailers catch it. If the, if the re <laughs> yeah. Well, considering okay. how many retailers are internet nowadays, you know, it's it's, if they can't if they catch it, if one of them catches it, all of them catch it. Yes, but it, it is hard to catch that. And I am so sorry that we are over our limit of time by quite a long time. I would like to thank